Christian Broadcast Ministries presents CBM Worship. We invite you to worship with us as we praise and worship our Lord together through music, prayer, and God's Word. We bring you CBM Worship from the Sanctuary of the Wayside Temple, 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia, Ohio. We pray you'll be blessed and encouraged as we worship our Lord together. Shout, be your 
worship together. Father, we're so thankful for the sweet Holy Spirit who has met here with us today. And Lord, it's our heart's desire that he would move in our hearts and in our lives in a fresh way. Lord, your word teaches us that those that are the sons of God, they are led by the Spirit of God. And we want to welcome the Holy Spirit today to do a fresh work in us. Lord, sometimes we need correction. Sometimes we've lost our way. Sometimes, Lord, we're zealous, but not according to knowledge. And we just need to discover your will, your purpose. We need you to guide us and show us. Father, I pray your spirit will work with our hearts in this place this morning. And I pray, Father, you'll call each one of us that know you Lord, call us more so to your will and purpose. Now, Lord, as sure as you call us, we gotta leave something behind. We gotta let you be the potter. And Lord, we're just the clay. Mold us, shape us into vessels unto honor, we pray. And Lord, what of that heart today that's in this building, we're watching and listening, that does not know the Savior. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will visit them in convicting power. Help them to see, Lord. Open their understanding. Lord, deal with their heart. We're so lost, Lord. And we've, we've went our own way. We're not going to seek you, Lord, but you come seeking after us. Holy Spirit, touch our hearts today. And that individual that needs Christ, I pray your spirit today will draw them and save them to your glory. Now have your way in this service, Lord. And may we leave this place encouraged in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen and amen. If you love the Lord, can I have a good amen? Yes. yes. Before you're seated, welcome someone near you as you're able with a good handshake and a good smile today. Your come. 
so we wait. So we wait. We wait. In my 
That's a good message right there. Aren't you glad the Lord is the God of all your days? Praise his name. You know, I was listening to the words of that song. My seasons change, but my God never changes. Aren't you glad about that? Ooh, praise the Lord. We have um, the opportunity this morning to hear from Brother Clayton Sosa. Brother Clayton is uh, attending uh, Christian University. He can bring you up to speed on all that. Tell us all you want to about the university, Brother Clayton, as it might be appropriate. Come right on. And yes. And um, Brother Clayton is learning and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And you know, I think Christian University is meant to stir the fire a little bit. And we pray that uh, you will enjoy what he has on his heart today. Just take your time, brother. God bless you, buddy. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone this morning? Good. Aside from the weather being the same every uh, day, you know, all the rain and everything, I think I'm doing pretty good. Because <laughs> I work at Cedar Point and I'm out um, outside all the time, so it gets a little annoying sometimes with all the rain and the lightning and the thunder. But um, before I get started, I just want to thank uh, Pastor Rusty uh, for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, I think it's a great honor. Um, and, while I'm away at college, I, you know, I miss being here. I miss uh, worshiping with all of you and um, you know, talking to some of you um, about the Lord and um, things of that sort. Even though I get it over at uh, Mount Vernon, I miss um, doing it here. Um, so recently I've been talking to Pastor Rusty a little bit about um, education um, and so on and so forth, and he mentioned it. Um, as some of you know, I've just finished my second year of college at Mount Vernon Nazarene <clears throat> University, where I'm doing a double major in Integrated Social Studies Education and History, and I'm also doing a minor in Political Science as well. So with the degree that I have, I'll be able to teach uh, for my license here anywhere from 7th grade to 12th grade. Um, and I also have the ability to teach um, government, geography, economics, world history, and American history. Um, I love it. It's great. <laughs> I'm very passionate about that. And um, so uh, last week, Pastor Rusty asked me a hypothetical question uh, before his sermon started, if I had bought one of the new Christian education magazines he was presenting. And before I could answer, he said, uh, never mind, Clayton, you're poor, you're a college student, so it doesn't matter. So that's totally relatable. And if you're in college right now or you've already been in college, uh, you know how that is uh, financially. <laughs> So um, that being said, um, this morning I would like to use for a subject, uh, education and Christianity uh, spreading the gospel. Um, and I think it's so important that we have good educators in general, as well as Christian education. They're both very important. Um, and I've experienced both types. I went to a public um, high school, Margareta um, High School, just down the road. And right now, like I said before, I currently go to a Christian university. So I've experienced a little bit of both. Um, so. If you could turn with me in your Bibles uh, really quick um, for the scripture reading, um, we'll go to Proverbs um, chapter 9, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. I'll give you a moment to turn there with me. Again, that's Proverbs um, chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. I have it up on the screen there as well. It's a little small, but you might be able to read it. <laughs> All right, starting with verse 1. Wisdom hath builded her house. 
She hath, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As, far, as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and I live, or and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. And this is um, the important part right here um, for the message. Verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Uh, verse 10. Fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And everything that we believe about education and Christian education um, from the believer's perspective, I believe, starts right here in verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's where it all starts, with the Lord and His Word. And um, you can also skip over to Proverbs chapter 22, and we will read verses 1 through 12. Um, also talking about wisdom and education as well. Proverbs chapter 22 Verse 1 through 12. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together, the Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is the servant to the lender. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth his bread to the poor. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips the king shall be his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of, of the transgressor. And I'll just reread verse 12, because that's where I want our focus to be today. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. Again, that's where knowledge begins, and that's where it starts. So uh, before we move along, um, let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. And I, I typically get very nervous <laughs> before I speak. And I just pray that you would just give me the right words to say today, and that it wouldn't be my words, but it would be your words. And I pray that even if it doesn't come out of my mouth the right way, that somebody in here can take it, and you can make it um, just understanding to them, so um, that they can just use that for their life, and they can honor you. Um, I pray for everybody in this building. I don't know what you're all going through, but I pray that God would meet your needs today and this week. I pray for safety for you. And I pray that the Lord would minister to your heart. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to show you a couple quotes. Uh, if we'll go to the next slide. Um, this quote is from C.S. Lewis. Um, he was a famous um, Christian scholar, writer, and educator. Um, and he had a, a quote that I really like about education. He said, The task of the modern educator is to not cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. And I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And I think what he means when he says that is first we have to plant the seed. We have to make sure that that foundation is there when we start teaching somebody. And then secondly, um, I think he wants us to um, encourage student growth. And when he says, uh, but to irrigate deserts, I think he means, you know, to turn something that is barren, to turn something that is plain um, into a flourishing oasis. And I think he's talking about students there um, as well. So changing that. Uh, nurturing it, making it grow. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this is another quote on education from uh, Basil Moro, and he was a French priest um, in the 1800s um, and an educator as well. And he said, education is the art of helping young people to completeness. For the Christian, this means education is helping a young person to be more like Christ, the model of all Christians. And I think it's neat because you can almost see here that he's talking about Christians not teaching in a Christian place, but maybe teaching in a, in a public place because he says, 
education is the art of helping young people to completeness. But then he says, for the Christian, this means, and then he goes on to say, um, letting people be more like Christ, the model of all Christians. Can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> just, that's just a picture of a classroom right there. It's kind of what I deal with in my uh, field placement a little bit. So, um, so let me just tell you a little bit about um, why um, God called me into education and why I think um, He wants me there. <clears throat> um, I loved learning about um, the ideological battle that um, we know as the Cold War in high school. It was like during my sophomore year, I started to develop a really... Um, interest in history, politics, government, um, things of that sort. And um, so I sought God and I talked with him and I thought, you know, if I love these things like history and government, I feel that the best way for me to express it is to teach it to other students uh, because that passion is there. And I believe, you know, the Bible says, um, you know, he'll give us the desires of our hearts. And if we seek his will, I believe that he'll make that happen. Um, so... I feel that that's how God wants me to help build the kingdom, through education and teaching. Um, and I think by uh, sowing gospel threads um, in history and social studies, I think there's a great um, door um, that God will open to share the gospel through history and education. I mean, when I say sowing gospel threads, um, all I mean when I say that is just ever so gently weaving the gospel into others' lives, uh, little by little, because I think you know, these things take time. Um, and since I've started going there to Mount Vernon, um, it's been such an invigorating and worthwhile experience. Um, I've learned so much about education itself, how to teach, uh, what the laws of the land are, um, and how to interact with um, other students. And a lot of the things we learn are very practical. Um, you know, how to integrate certain activities um, in the classroom, um, lesson planning, um, things of that sort, how to accommodate students that have certain disabilities. So it's really good. Um, and I like that. And I think we need um, good godly educators to be there in, in, in those places. So I've also made many um, great friends while I'm at Mount Vernon. I've met a lot of great professors who have a heart for the Lord. Um, they're Christian educators as well. Um, so the education program at MVNU, Mount Vernon, it basically has two parts. So first you learn your content area, you know, whatever that is, history, math, science. And then the second part is the education part where you apply that content area to the classroom. Um, so that's what I've been learning and I think it's pretty neat. Um, I've also learned a lot more historical information from some of the professors that I've had. Um, one of my college professors, his name's Dr. Wantland, he always gets really into his lectures and his presentations and he moves around a lot and he jumps around a lot. And that, that's kind of how I want to be. You know, you want to be passionate, you want to be engaging. And I see that in him, in Dr. Wantland. And it's really cool because um, he's, he's a big uh, Civil War historian, and he loves the Civil War. So whenever, we get, whenever he um, presents a lesson on the Civil War, he'll typically dress in the attire that they would have worn um, in the 1850s or 1860s. So it's really neat. He gets all into that. But um, he's told um, his classes some pretty interesting and unlikely stories in American history, and I'd like to share one with you. Listen to this. Um, one funny story was about the seventh president, Andrew Jackson, in the 1830s. Um, and it goes a little something like this, so listen. It's not surprising to learn that Andrew Jackson was the first American president to become the target of an assassination. The attack occurred on January 30th, 1835. Jackson was on Capitol Hill to attend the funeral services for Congressman Warren R. Davis. As the president filed past the casket and descended to the rotunda, Richard Lawrence, an unemployed house painter, stepped up, drew a pistol, and fired point blank at Jackson. A percussion cap exploded, but a bullet failed to discharge from the gun barrel. Point blank, it failed to discharge. Characteristically, Jackson charged his would-be killer with complete abandon and contempt, while his breathless vice president, Martin Van Buren, looked on horrified. <laughs> Lifting his cane above his head, the 67-year-old Jackson lunged at his assailant. Before he could reach him, however, Lawrence drew a second pistol and fired again. Unbelievably, this gun also failed to fire. <laughs> After the second attempt failed and some semblance of order was restored, Jackson went about his business as if nothing had ever happened. As for Lawrence, he spent the rest of his life in Washington's Government Hospital for the Insane. I think that's where he should have been. <laughs> but, I mean, what a unique story. 
And and American history is chock full of these unique stories. I would almost consider that divine providence. You know, the fact that both of those guns that he had, both of those pistols failed to fire. It's crazy. It's, It's insane. But I love it. It's great. So let me tell you a little bit about my um, field placement. So um, we know that because of certain laws of the land, because um, of certain congressmen and congresswomen's legislation, it can be hard for teachers um, to share their faith in the classroom. Um, Sometimes it can be very hard, and you might risk losing your job um, for sharing your faith in the classroom. So the question then becomes, how do I integrate my faith in a public school? How do I integrate my faith into the classroom? Well, let me tell you what I did. So every year, as part of the education program in Mount Vernon, um, we are placed in a school for our license area to observe and teach. Last year, I was placed in a freshman world history class at Lexington High School. And um, this past spring semester, in the spring, um, I was placed in a junior high ancient world history and an American history class. And these were seventh and eighth graders, Um, so my brother's age. So it helped me out a little bit. Um, so th- I think that um, seventh and eighth graders are a really good age group, actually, to teach. Um, if I had my choice, I think I would want to teach junior high, because um, I think they're at that age where they're mature enough to pay attention, but at the same time, I think they have an active and energetic attitude. But there's problems, again, with any age group. <laughs> um, and I think I wouldn't want to teach um, juniors and seniors, because typically they just want to get out of high school. They just want to leave. I know, I know that's how I felt when I was a senior. Senior right is kicked in as early as junior year. <laughs> but um, so I was at um, Centerburg Middle School um, in Central Ohio for my spring field placement, which is a public school. And um, I-, I was there once a week every Tuesday, and I would either um, teach a lesson or I would observe. Um, so for one of my ancient world history classes that I taught, I taught a lesson on the medieval uh, European church in the 1100s and 1200s. And the main reason I did this was because um, the lesson was about certain Christian practices like communion and about the Inquisition um, in in medieval Europe. So I wanted to get some feedback from the students on, you know, what what their view of religion was, you know, where where they were coming from a little bit. And that was one way that I wanted to engage with them, one way that I wanted to interact with them on a greater level. You can go to the next slide, please. So I don't know if you can see it or not, but this was the card activity that I did. I said, and this is what I gave to the class, on a note card, write your own thought or idea about religion or Christianity. This could be something that you already know about religion or have experienced about religion. And just for some of the examples, I said, do you go to church, Um, your opinion on religion in general? Um, And then for the last one, I said, you can make a prediction about the lesson. And let me just show you what some of their responses were. You can go to the next slide, please. So this student, for the first part, said um, no, um, that he thinks it's fake and just a big story. And for the prediction part, he said, um, we're going to talk about religion. And then there at the bottom, um, for the first part, um, do you go to church? This student said, I used to go to church. And then the student said, my opinion on religion is that it's important because it's what you believe in and helps for decisions you make. Next one, please. This student said, I believe everyone has the right to believe what they want. I personally don't believe anything. So you can kind of see, um, you know, a lot of students are coming from different um, perspectives. Um, There at the bottom, I feel like you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. Hmm. Next one. Um, There is a higher probability science is correct rather than God being real. Any God for that matter. Next slide, please. Um, I went to church when I was younger. Uh, with my dad, but I stopped going recently. I don't really care for religion. It's just been one of those talks in my house. And um, I, I think it's really important that, you know, that we do these things. Sometimes I think, you know, we, we preach doom and gloom a lot of times about, you know, public education and so on and so forth. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there if we're willing to work with students and ask them questions like these. Um, I went to church when I was younger, but don't really go anymore. I would like to start going again. Now, see, there's optimism right there. Um, I don't go to church that often, but I wish I did. I believe in Christianity, but I also believe that if you believe in a different religion, that it's true. 
So we can see that, you know, some of their answers, and again, they're 7th and 8th graders, so, you know, they might not understand everything yet, but we can see here that there's, you know, a willingness in some of these students' lives to maybe pursue a little bit more, to seek Christ, you know, he said he wanted to go to church, he wanted to start going again, so it's there. I believe that that hope is there, and we need to find it, and we need um, to pray to the Lord that he would give us the ability to seek it out and um, just to do what he would call us to do. So the next one, um, my thoughts on Christianity. I do go to church, so I know a lot about religion. I feel like it has a way of changing people, um, how they do things and their activities. It changes how they act. And that's so true. That student was right on. Uh, for better or for worse, religion does, and it influences the way we act and how we treat people. So they're at the bottom. Oh, I read that one already. You can go to the next one. Oh, this one was kind of random. What is the percentage of Christians in Ohio? <laughs> I thought that was a little random. I don't even know that, though. Oh, I like this one. She said, um, I go to church and I'm a Jesus girl. My opinion is anyone can believe what they want, but I believe in Christianity. So it's pretty good. Um, no, I don't like religion, but I could support it. But when you're in a religion, you could feel trapped like my cousin. Eww. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but 7th and 8th graders... Um, yeah, oh, I like this one too. I go to church, so I think that religion and what you believe is important. I think that we will talk about the church's religion. It's important to believe in something with religion. It can vary with different societies, and that's true as well. Um, you can definitely see um, some true things and some very accurate things um, that students this age know and that they're presenting. Um, I have gone to church, but I don't anymore because my dad thinks different people interpret the Bible. Also true, um, in their own way. I know what I know about Christianity now because of him and reading the Bible. He also talks with us about different religions and how, they've, um, how they're different from Christianity. And then there at the bottom, she's got two hearts, a cross, and God we trust. And, I, I, you know, that, that brings great joy to me as a believer, um, seeing these things from such a young age group, you know, even, even if they don't understand everything. Um, no, don't believe in God, but something higher than him. Believe in what you want to believe. This one was probably my favorite one, and this is the last one that I'll show you today. I go to a Christian church. My opinion is that you should be a Christian and go to church. Spread the message and believe in God and follow the Bible. That's a matter of fact right there to the point. I like it. Uh, next slide, please. So, so you see, by doing this activity, on um, this card activity, I was able to see where my students were coming from in terms of religion. But I was doing it within the confines of the classroom and the lesson, and because of this, I was able to share my own faith with them, um, with the class in a public school. Imagine that. So you see, teaching history can open so many doors to sow gospel threads, because history deals so much with Christianity, and it deals so much with men and women who loved Christ and who pursued a life to make the world a better place because of their faith. People like Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, Mother Teresa, C.S. Lewis, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., and so many more. History is chock full of Christian leaders who made the world a better place. You know, if I'm teaching um, an American history class and I come across a lesson about the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 1960s, it would be impossible to overlook um, that lesson without touching on somebody like Martin Luther King, who in many of his speeches referenced Scripture um, referenced um, the Bible, um, you know, going back to those roots. And that, that is what propelled him, that's what pushed him um, to fight for civil rights and equality and things like that. And I think it's great, and we cannot overlook it. That's why history uh, is so great, um, to sow gospel threads. But perhaps the best way that I as a teacher, and this goes for anybody in any profession, can show Christ is how I live and how I act and how I treat other people. Sometimes it's not what it is, it's just what it looks like. Um, and then I would, I would like to read to you um, Galatians chapter 5, um, verses 22 through 26. And I don't believe I have that up there. Oh, I do. Okay, so verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. No, no, Galatians 5, 22. I have it here, I'm sorry. So it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying others. And I just wanted to say that why, why it's so important that, you know, how we act and how we live, because this verse says it right there. We need to make sure in any profession that we are displaying these attributes, the fruits of the Spirit, again, which are love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But again, regardless of profession, regardless of job, we need to do this as Christians. We need to find a way in the secular world to share the gospel so others see these fruits of the Spirit so that they know we are Christian and that they will know that Jesus Christ lives inside of us. That's what we need to do. They need to see it. So this world that's constantly telling us, we don't want to hear about your God, we don't want to hear about your Jesus, we don't want to hear about your faith, a world that constantly tells us you cannot share your faith here, we need to somehow find a way to go against the tide and to share our faith, even if it means losing our job, losing our status, or losing friends, because eternity is so much more important than that. And the things of God are so much more important than any temporary pleasure or job that this world has to offer. And I'll say it this way, you'd be mistaken if you think me, Clayton Sosa, is going to sit in a classroom year after year and watch hundreds of students come in and out of my classroom without ever seeing Christ in me. I will not let that happen. And we cannot do that. Because like I said, eternity is so important. Um, let me just share with you another example um, of something that happened in high school, when I was in high school. And I think it was a great way um, that, that my teacher um, tried to share the gospel in some form or fashion. So in junior high, in my junior high science class, um, we learned about the origins of the earth, and I think my teacher did a great thing. Um, she provided different theories about the origins of the earth, um, rather than just teaching macroevolution, rather than just teaching it one way. She taught intelligent design, which is what uh, us Christians would believe is creationism. Um, she taught that. She taught evolution and several other theories. And I liked the way that she did that because it allowed us as students to have open minds about a controversial uh, subject. And it wasn't mandated. Um, one of the assignments that we had in that class um, was to write a paper on which theory we believed on how the earth was created. So she kind of left it us left it up to us, to the students, on how we believed. So I wrote about intelligent design, and I used the creation account in Genesis to back up the points that I was making. And um, when I was in high school, um, it's a little contrary to what I just told you, when I was in high school, during my sophomore year, I had a teacher who only taught the origins of the earth one way, rather than giving other options. So one day, um, I saw him in the lunchroom, and I asked him, if he would teach other theories rather than just macroevolution. And he pretty much said no, and that if you want to teach about creationism, you should only do that in a religious setting or a Christian school or something like that. And I thought to myself, well, I had a teacher at this same school that already gave other options. She already did that. So I think, I think that's his own personal bias getting in the way. But um, So I disagreed with him, uh, like I said, because in junior high, my teacher taught different ways. And um, we as teachers do have some freedom as to what we present in the classroom. Sometimes it's just how we do it. Again, sewing those gospel threads, we can do it. So um, my university um, at MVNU, they also place a special emphasis on diversity. And this isn't just race, it's you know, economic background, special needs students, students with disabilities, um, second language learners, so that would be students that don't know English as their first language, um, and all different types of um, learners, auditory learners, uh, visual learners, and I think we need to accommodate these. We need to try and be um, all-inclusive, because I think that's Christ, what, what Christ would want. And I'm happy that my college uh, puts an emphasis on this. Um, so another major point about teaching is, I think that the character of the teacher is so important. Um, the type of traits that they display, the type of attributes that they display. Um, teacher, teaching is so important because we interact with students every day and they see us every day. I remember most of my teachers very well, how they moved, how they acted, um, how they treated others. 
Um, and we, so we have a great impact on students. And another thing about being a teacher is that we have no idea um, what type of background that our students come from, what their home life is like. They could come from a broken home, from a violent home. Uh, maybe they live with grandparents. Maybe they have two moms or two dads. Maybe their parents are on drugs. Maybe they're on drugs. Maybe they have no parents. Maybe they struggle financially. Maybe they don't even have a house. Um, my mentor teacher this past semester um, said, he explained to me a situation which I didn't really believe it at first. It was really out there. Um, he said that he um, once had a student um, that just lived in a, in a makeshift house that resembled a tent out in the woods. Uh, that's, that's quite sad. And every day this student would come to school and the staff, you know, the principal, the teachers would notice that, you know, she would itch on her arms about every day. And they were from bug bites and mosquito bites because she lived out in the woods and her, I mean, her family couldn't afford anything. And it's true, but it's sad. And that's why, that's why teachers are so important. Just that little, that little glimmer of hope that we can provide. And it's even more important for the Christian. So uh, also during my field placement, uh, my mentor teacher came up to me uh, when I was standing at the back of the room one day and he said, you see that girl over there? And she was sitting by the window. He said, I just walked by her and I saw that she had written, uh, death is cool on her arm. That's what she had written, death is cool. And he explained to me that she had just lost her grandmother about a year ago uh, prior to that and that she was really close to her and she was um, suffering um, from depression and things like that. So again, this is what I mean. I have no idea as a teacher what type of student I will have and what they're going through. We could be the only good influence. We could be the only Jesus that they see. So I as a teacher have an enormous impact because if they aren't getting loved at home and if they aren't receiving good things at home, then I believe it's the job of teachers to provide some measure or degree of that love and even more so for the Christian teacher because we know the type of love that Christ has shown us. By Him dying on the cross, we know that. We know it personally if we have that relationship. Um, and all of this um, revolves around the Great Commission, wherever we are and whoever we are. And um, we can go to that slide now, Matthew, the Great Commission, 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And then kind of to go along with that, this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.20, complements it well. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And I, and I, you know, looking at those verses, I think that the Christian structure and how we view it is so unique because we have this view of two conflicting worlds the saved, born-again Christian world, and then the unbelieving, atheistic world. And of course, there's variations in between. Um, there's a lot of different types of beliefs in between, but you can't be on the fence. So um, it's almost like we have this base, this foundation, almost like this training, you know, going to church, having our Bible study, reading the Bible, being raised in a Christian environment. We have all of these things, and then when God calls us to that place, wherever it is, we take all of that training, we take all of that scripture, everything that our Heavenly Father has taught us, and we take it out beyond the walls of the church. We take it out and we apply it to our lives so that we can build the kingdom. And we should be doing this every week. Um, last week, I remember um, Zach and Pastor Rusty were having a brief conversation about Zach's work. And Zach was saying how he was glad that he had a four-day weekend for Memorial Day. He loved it. He did a lot of great things. But, um, and then I overheard um, Pastor Rusty say, yes, you need that recharge. You need to be recharged. You need that break. And I think kind of that's how we as Christians should look at life. You know, we need that recharge. 
Every time when we come to church, every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we need that recharge. And it, it's, it, we should look at it like it's a cycle. We recharge with God, then we apply that to our lives, and we build the kingdom. Recharge with God, apply it to our lives, build the kingdom. Recharge with God, apply it to our lives, build the kingdom. That's what we need to do. That's what Scripture commands us right there. So what do I mean when I say applying it to our lives? What, what does that entail? What does building the kingdom mean? I think that we should look for ways that we can start that conversation about Christ. We need to look for ways, and for me it's an education, to share the gospel. We need to look for that opportunity there. A few days ago, I mentioned this in um, Sunday school this morning, I had a very interesting experience. Um, so at Cedar Point a few days ago, uh, because I'm a supervisor there, I have to come in about 45 minutes before the rest of the crew does to get everything ready, to get the supplies. And um, once, of the, once the rest of the um, workers got there at our meeting place, um, we have a lot of international workers, and some of them are from Jamaica. And they have a very high Christian population in Jamaica. We have a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ in Jamaica. And so out of the corner of my eye when they got there in the morning, I saw them kind of go over to the side, and they were getting ready to pray. I was like, wow, can I join you guys? I, I want to be in on this. This is great. And um, so, yeah, they said, yeah. And so we all got in a circle right there at work, right there at Cedar Point, and we just started praying. And it was amazing. And the neat thing about it is, is some of the other workers that I would not consider Christians, <laughs> they came too, and they prayed with us. Even though, you know, they, they might not believe or whatever, they came with us and they prayed with us. And, and I think that that's a perfect example of looking for ways, you know, in the secular world, in a secular environment, to share the gospel so that other people can see it. And like I said, they joined in. Amen. So, um, and like I said, um, you know, wh why do you think we have such an emphasis on things like friend night? You know, bringing people in. Why do you think we have such an emphasis on the promotion around Easter time to invite the unchurched and the unbelieving? Because we need to go out, recharge, apply it, build the kingdom, bring them in. That's what we need to do. We must go out beyond the walls in those places to which God has called us and build the kingdom. For me, it's in education and in public service. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So my question to you today is what is that place for you? What is that place for you to witness today? Mine is in teaching and at work. What's your occupation? What's your place of employment? Where does God have you right now to build the kingdom? I know some of you are retired in here, but God has still placed people in your life that you can speak to, and it never stops. From the, from the day we become a Christian until the day that we die, we should constantly be building the kingdom. There's real, there should really be no retirement <laughs> when it comes to spreading the gospel. So again, how can I sow gospel threads? How can I, little by little, weave in scripture, weave in the gospel? How can we do it? And I want you all to think about these questions. And maybe some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Maybe some of you don't even know what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you don't know what it means when I say build the kingdom. Uh, it's, it's quite simple. You will know by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this relationship with Jesus Christ is a free gift, a free gift that God gave us on a very, very important day in history. Jesus Christ died on the cross. God became man. And because of Jesus Christ, uh, God bridged the gap between us and himself because there's a void there. There's a gap Sin has taken that away. And on that special day when Christ died, he took that sin away. He took it away from all of us, past, present, future. But we need to accept that gift. It's free. We need to accept that. Um, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will be saved. For with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation, and with, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. This is what we do, confessing it, believing it, and realizing what Christ did for us at the cross. Jesus came to live like us, um, to talk with us, to walk with us, to show us how God is, to show us what God is like. And I think it's so amazing when we look at it this way. 
And if you want to have this relationship with Christ that I talk about, if you want to experience God's goodness and this relationship, do not leave this building without making that decision. Do not leave this building without talking to somebody about Christ. If you have questions, whatever it may be, it's an invitation. Come and accept it. So I'm going to close with prayer, and then we can be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, I again just want to thank you um, for this opportunity, just uh, these brief moments that I had um, to share the gospel, and just to share with the congregation what God has placed on my heart. And I just pray that this example that I gave of teaching in, in, in education um, and teaching in a public school, I pray that every person in here will take that example and apply it to their lives and think of the types of jobs that they are in and see how they can sow gospel threads. See how they can seek you, find an opportunity to present Christ, start that conversation. I pray that over everybody in this place today, that they would seek you, and if they don't know you, that they would accept you as their personal Lord and Savior, because I guarantee them that it will change their life forever and you will give them a peace and understanding that surpasses everything that this world has to offer. I pray all of these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. It has been a blessing for us to worship together this time, and we invite you to come worship with us. CBM is located 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia, easily accessible from State Route 2. Take Route 2 to State Route 101 South and turn left onto Maple Avenue. We would love to have you visit. And don't forget, it's your prayers and gifts of love that bring this program into your home each week. Send your gifts of support, prayer requests, and comments to CBM, Box 247, Castalia, Ohio, 44824. CBM Worship is a production and presentation of Christian Broadcasting Ministries. CBM. Proclaiming the Word.